Hello and welcome to Talk Africa. Now the theme of this year's World AIDS Day through to 2015 is getting to zero. Zero new HIV infections, zero discrimination and zero AIDS related deaths. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, remains one of the world's most serious health and development challenges. In 1983, scientists discovered the virus that causes AIDS. By 2013, there were approximately 35 million people living with HIV, and since the epidemic, 78 million people have been infected. 2.1 million individuals worldwide became newly infected with HIV in 2013. Over 240,000 of them were children. Now, most of these children live in sub-Saharan Africa and were infected by their HIV-positive mothers during pregnancy, childbirth, or breastfeeding. According to a UNAIDS report, 19 million of the 35 million people living with HIV today do not know that they have the virus. Sub-Saharan Africa is the most affected region with 24.7 million people infected and living with HIV by 2013. 71% of all people who are living with HIV in the world live in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, an estimated 39 million people have died since the first case was reported in 1983, and 1 1.5 million people died of AIDS-related causes in 2013. At the end of 2013, though, 12.9 million people were living with HIV and were receiving antiretroviral therapy globally, of which 11.7 million were in low- and middle-income countries. Now, South Africa is one of the hardest-hit countries in the world, and it is estimated that 12.2% of the South African population, about 6.4 million people, are HIV positive. Considering its impact on the economy, HIV AIDS has become one of the critical priorities for South Africa's government. Now, South Africa's Health Minister Aaron Motswaledi provides some of the answers in this interview with CCTV's Guy Henderson. Minister Aaron Motswaledi, thank you very much for joining um, CCTV Africa. You are um, South Africa's Minister of Health. You are um, largely credited with leading a tremendous and quite dramatic um, turnaround in South Africa's fight against HIV. The United Nations has, uh, perhaps partly because of your good work, your good leadership, has now ambitiously claimed that it will aim to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. As someone who is the Minister of a country with a third of the entire world's HIV positive people. Do you think that that target is realistic? Oh yes, I, I do believe it's realistic because they've defined what it means. They didn't just out of the blue just say we must bring an end to HIV AIDS. They, they, they defined what they mean by that and they defined it by the 1990. That simply that by that time 90 percent of populations must know their status. And that 90% of those who are HIV positive must be on treatment. And that 90% of those who are on treatment are virally suppressed. When we reach that stage, then we'll, we'll, we'll say we've eliminated HIV and AIDS. And that is, that's possible. Are you on your way to those targets? I mean, you're very upfront, um, you know, in your annual reports about how you're doing. And, and just to list a couple of key stats of targets you seem to have missed, um, testing for HIV, you targeted 13 million, you only reached 6.69 million in the 13, 14 calendar year. And then male circumcision as well, you targeted 600,000 uh, and you only managed to get 422,000. Why are you missing some of those key targets? Well, I don't think we're missing them. Uh, we have just started. When we, the president of the country launched the HCT campaign, we're targeting 13 million people in one year, but we end up reaching 18 million in 18 months. I don't really think that is a miss, considering that a lot of academics were arguing that it's impossible. Because before that campaign was launched, we are reaching only 2 million people. What the else? issue of medical male circumcision, we are targeting 4 million males by 2016. We have not yet arrived at 2016, but in between we may target for ourselves. Obviously in the beginning, the, the take up will be a little bit low, especially in provinces where, in areas where people don't traditionally practice circumcision. It's a new thing to, for them, and we need to make it popular. They need to understand it before they venture into, into, into the idea. Only a decade ago, in 2004, we had 400,000 people. Now we have got 2.4 million. Mm. You can imagine the number of health facilities 
and the number of health workers, the doctors, nurses, cannot increase at such a rate. What is increasing at that rate is the number of patients. So what are the results? The result is congestion in the healthcare facilities. And the result is longer waiting times. Where a person used to wait for one hour, they now wait for eight to 10 hours because of a huge volume of people. And of course they complain. Many of them believe health workers are no longer working as hard as they used to do a decade ago. Not aware that no, we've just increased their workload 10 times, you know. And yet we can't reverse that. And we said in 2016, this number 2.7 million must be doubled to about 4.6 million. So what do you do under those conditions? You look for an innovative method. So one of the innovative methods is what we call chronic medication program, whereby you identify these people who are stable, who have been stable for quite some time, who don't have to be examined by a doctor or a nurse, who are just coming there to collect their monthly uh, treatment, you know, their monthly medication. So, so instead of them coming to the clinic to cure with the others and increasing the congestion, you're asking them to identify the area where that medicine can be delivered. In some extreme cases, we're even going to use churches and community venues whereby people will go. And if you do so, you decongest the clinics and only those who are acutely ill will go to the clinics. That is the only way we can sustain such a massive, massive program. What about the number of trained medical professionals? You're taking all of these new patients on. The health system is increasingly strained because of that success. Do you have the doctors? I think 1,200 doctors in the whole of South Africa qualified last year. Do you need more? We need more doctors, most certainly. But there was no way we were going to reach 2.7 million people with doctors. It's impossible. Or even if not doctors, medical professionals, yes. nurses, yes. etc. Yeah, we, we are using nurses. We, we are doing the program. The success of the program is lying on what is called NIRMAT. NIRMAT means nurse initiated antiretroviral uh, therapy, uh, whereby you train nurses specifically and give them certificates so that these are specific type of nurses who have been trained in such a way that without the presence of a doctor, if they come across a patient who's HIV positive, they can start treatment. How have you managed to lead and engineer this a turnaround this, this dramatic? Well, look, Death was an everyday occurrence in South Africa. People were buried, you know. You used to listen to radio stations and, and hear people talking about alternative means of burials because every municipality was seeking to expand or have a new graveyard in almost every village. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Home Affairs Death Register, death doubled in South Africa within a period of nine years, like when you are in a war situation. So we mm -hmm. had to stop that. One had to sit down and think and say, how do we stop this? Because it can't go on. We cannot afford it as a country, uh, that type of situation to go on. And that's why we had to sit down and come with all these innovations. And fortunately, the public agreed and they cooperated. And here we are uh, on the road to success. Now, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa's hardest hit, has begun to turn around the AIDS epidemic. It has made remarkable progress in expanding access to antiretroviral treatment, as well as in reducing new HIV infections. CCTV's Rene Delcom examines how medical workers are battling the scourge tide in KwaZulu-Natal. With a population of around 3 million people, Durban is the biggest city in the South African province of KwaZulu-Natal. It's a vibrant, multicultural tourist mecca, known for its hot, spicy dishes and warm Indian Ocean beaches. But it is also the province in South Africa with the most alarming increase of HIV infection rates. We have a tendency of saying, a Zulu warrior must have many girlfriends. Now, when we came in the teaching that one man, one woman, that was totally unacceptable. And they did not believe that there was any sickness that did not have a remedy to be cured. So like HIV, they, they said that was a dream. That was not something that was 
really there. The one of the things that we find really heartbreaking is that uh, for the past decade, we haven't seen a huge shift in the number of new infections among women, uh, especially in the greater Durban area where I work. You know, the infection rates are hovering around five, six on average for every hundred women in one year. Some communities in the north have infection rates among women up to nine per every hundred women in one year. So that is alarmingly high. Even sex workers in other countries do not have such a high infection rate that we are seeing here in KwaZulu-Natal. Professor Ramji, who is regarded as an international authority in the field of HIV prevention, says she knows there's no silver bullet. And behavior alone will not change the course of the epidemic. So she and her team at the Medical Research Council are committed to clinical trials in HIV prevention and treatment, especially trying to stop women from bearing the brunt of HIV infections. So that is something that sort of bothers me, that what is it that is different among women here that we are not able to address the high infection rates? Professor Ramji says many current prevention options, such as male condoms, are not always within the woman's control. And safe sex negotiation is limited due to behavioral and cultural norms in society. Men do not want to use condoms. They say they were not created to use condoms. It's not part of their way. Uh, and they even take it as an insult on their side. In 2014, we're still having high infection rates among women, and that is totally unacceptable. We need to educate young girls, we need to empower them to be self-sufficient, and we need to ensure that they have biomedical and other options to prevent HIV among themselves. Nobody's telling anyone, stop having sex, but assess your risk and, and mitigate those risks by using options of HIV prevention that suit your lifestyle. The Medical Research Council says it's due to start vaccine trials next year as the next big scientific step to try and stem the tide of HIV AIDS for future generations. Renard Alcom, CCTV, Durban. Well, for two decades, it was a leader in Africa's fight against HIV-AIDS. But for Uganda, HIV-AIDS has more recently become a problem case again, with infection rates creeping up. CCTV's Isabel Nakiria takes us through Uganda's roller coaster journey with the pandemic. Early this year, James Mukasa made the decision to get tested for HIV. I would fall sick often but would take water. Then they would give me injections. Sometimes I would swallow capsules, and I didn't know the cause. But when I took my child for treatment, I was tested and told I was HIV positive. The 44-year-old builder believes he contracted the virus over three years ago. James is grateful that his wife of 20 years has tested negative. It's only God that protects. We were not using condoms all those years. We only got to know that it was only my husband sick this year in February. Olivia still lives with her husband, but she says they now practice safe sex. While James has been put on life-saving drugs that he needs to take daily. This couple say they are still shocked that only he is HIV positive. Researchers say HIV transmission in couples like this one is much reduced with antiretroviral treatment. Uganda estimates 65% of couples in the country are discordant. Campaigners, however, worry many HIV positive men in relationships with partners who do not have the virus are not fully accepting the dangers involved in unsafe sex. We've had challenges of men. They have had issues using condoms with their wives. And some of them will even give you 
the, the, the exchange of uh, if we are able to live together. I've been with my wife for all this time. Some have got children. So they keep on saying the God who helped us to be in a discordant relationship will make sure that I do not get HIV. The health ministry hopes to reduce numbers of discordant couples by promoting condom use and providing treatment to all HIV positive men and women in relationships with partners that do not have the virus. There was an indication that treatment uh, has contributed significantly by uh, about 96% uh, uh, reduction in, in the transmission of of HIV infection. Uganda hopes that if more couples get tested for HIV, then early treatment and counseling could help prevent transmission of the AIDS virus between partners. Isabel Nakiria, CCTV, Kampala. Well, the theme of this year's World AIDS Day through to 2015 is getting to zero. Zero new HIV infections, zero discrimination, zero AIDS-related deaths. But what is Africa's responsibility in the race towards getting to zero? When we return from the break, my guests on the program today will give their perspectives on this issue. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now, the theme for this year's World AIDS Day is getting to zero. So can Africa get to zero? Joining us to discuss this issue from Geneva is Mr. Louise Lores, the Deputy Executive Director, UNAIDS. In studio with me, Dr. Kizito Lubano, a researcher with the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Also with us, Mr. Gumba Joffrey Ocheng, a youth HIV and TB advocate here in Nairobi. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Mr. Louis Lores, there to you in Geneva. Africa has made tremendous progress in tackling the AIDS pandemic. Now, according to the African Union Commission, new infections have declined by 33% from 2005 to 2013. Can you begin by giving us a clearer indication of where exactly Africa is in terms of the AIDS pandemic? Africa, no question, is leading the response to, the, to AIDS today. The, where we see the, the, the biggest progress is in the African continent, uh, particularly in South Africa, in the countries that are the most affected, in Kenya, that's moving also pretty fast, basically in two directions, in cutting number of infections, as you spoke about, but also of putting people on treatment. But of course, major challenges remain. Africa is showing that we can move to the end of AIDS, but at the same time, we are seeing the major gaps that we need to, to resolve during the next five years. What remains, though, the key challenge in Africa, particularly in tackling the AIDS pandemic? I think if, if you want to one, the most important is the epidemic among young women in Africa. Rates of HIV among young girls in most of sub-Saharan Africa, they are three to five times higher compared to boys. This is clearly related to the condition of to the spatial vulnerability of women in the societies, and uh, is related to the way that the men relate to women, is related to intimate uh, partner violence, and that needs to be resolved. There is no end of AIDS if we don't we bring all these young women with us all the way to, to the end. All right, Dr. Lubano, you're, you're looking at this pandemic, of course, from the African uh, continent. Do you see, I see if a lot of gains have already been made to the date? Yes, I think uh, a tremendous amount of progress has been made. 
for example, the highest peaks like in Africa around about 1999, uh, 2000, when the peak was about 15% prevalence, now we are around about 6% uh, or less. And this is a big, big difference. In terms of moving forward as, as uh, the goal towards zero, there is, of course, the push towards now getting to have zero new infections, zero discrimination, and again, in terms of uh, zero deaths uh, related to AIDS. And this all requires uh, closing the gaps in terms of access to testing, uh, access to treatment, care and prevention, right. and support systems. But key uh, to mention is the focus on the uh, at-risk populations, particularly the young women and uh, vulnerable uh, uh, populations, that this is now the major focus and thrust that right. uh, we believe if we focus there, we probably can bring down the prevalence and we can achieve We're We are looking, and, and both of you have spoken about uh, the gains that have been made, though, but we are looking at some countries like Uganda where massive gains had been made, but they seem to be regressing again. We are looking at situ situations like Kenya, though, where the, the prevalence rate has come down from 14 to 6 percent. Now, in countries where regression is being witnessed, what's going on there? I think there are two things that have happened with an epidemic. After the, uh, the uh, start of the treatment with the antiretroviral drugs around about 1996 and increased access through support and partnership and resource mobilization, we saw tremendous uh, drop in terms of the prevalence and the new infections. However, we seem somehow in sub-Saharan Africa to have flatlined around about six, between five to seven percent. Most of the countries are flatlined there. Now, what the new information and research seems to point at, that we seem to have some kind of complacence that is getting in. As we learn more about the epidemic, as we begin to be more comfortable with the epidemic, there probably is a bit of a lessening of the aggressiveness right. of the messages. So we really need to go more aggressive. But what is critical, again, to focus on the key populations that we think seem to be driving and maintaining the epidemic at those percentages. And these are the sex workers, perhaps, and uh, men who have sex with men, the lesbians and gender and bi right. bisexuals and other populations. But again, we believe that new knowledge seems to be beginning to make people a bit more relaxed in terms of their behavior change. So All we right. need to find a new way of how to, to use this information. All right, uh, Geoffrey, let me get your experience uh, there uh, for the moment. I mean, you have been, uh, you're an advocacy, you're in advocacy there uh, against AIDS and, and TB there. Give us your experience. I mean, are we seeing a lot of gains now over the last 26 years in terms of how we relate to the pandemic itself, how we relate to HIV? Okay, before I say anything, myself, I'm 26 years living with the virus and I've learned more, I've been in this advocacy field. And uh, my advocacy point is normally the, the issue of uh, the younger girls where the prevalence is now is, uh, is coming up instead of going down. Okay, we've been doing things right but there is still a gap that needs to be filled because we know that uh, the community as uh, the larger population comprised of uh, especially women and the younger girls. Now it's just to come up maybe with the techniques on now what are we going to do but business unusual because like uh, we've heard from, from the doctor, doctor <coughs> from Daktari that most of the most at risk populations is where the prevalence is. And uh, in Africa, especially there's a UNAIDS report of 2010 where we are seeing a number of orphans who are born with HIV are now older people. And because of stigma and discrimination and the social issues, right. maybe they are not able to come out clearly and prevent their fellows from getting the infection. If I can just jump in uh, there, though, Geoffrey, uh, from your experience, what, what remains the biggest challenge? Because you have been living with the virus now for 26 years. What remains the biggest challenge here? Okay, the biggest challenge is still the issue of stigma and discrimination. Because personally, there's no any issue of uh, any illness or any disadvantages. I can work as any other person can do. But because of the society and the resources that are there, lack of employment and all that makes the fight to be more difficult. 
All right. And, and do you find, though, um, as an advocacy, as an advocate there, do you find that uh, there are some measures that have worked uh, for you in particular, for the larger community? And what are those measures that don't seem to be working? There are a number of measures that have worked, especially the, the policies that have been put in place. Like in Kenya, we have the meaningful involvement of uh, people living with HIV and the networks that are there, which are acting like the information centers. But this needs to be trickled down to the roots, to the community levels. All right. Uh, we're hearing, though, from a personal experience here, and we're also hearing from uh, the UNAID as to what should be done. Looking at it, though, from an Africa-wide uh, perception, I I is there a disconnecting approach, though, from the top to the bottom? Yes, I think uh, there, there are challenges, but again, this is uh, something we have been uh, learning as we go along. But uh, based on the 30 years' experience now, we believe that uh, there are useful lessons in terms of... Uh, for example, the programming, that is how we have configured our programs to reach various people. Now, as we see more of the young girls and the adolescents being more affected, that calls for us now to be able to design our programs uh, in terms of all the interventions to be able to reach those people in the appropriate way so that they can be able to, to also engage in uh, uh, supporting the prevention towards zero. Traditionally, how we began is HIV has been dealt with in a very exclusive way. Right. It has its own type of structures right from the global level. It's still a national disaster in Kenya, but right now there is more thinking in terms of uh, avoiding parallel systems and integrating it into the normal uh, routine care so that people accessing care don't have to go to a special clinic. They can be able to access that type of care uh, in all the type of uh, general routine clinics. But that again is the challenge in terms of getting all the resources, the human resource trained, the supplies and equipment, and the infrastructure, for example, the laboratories and testing, and the drugs and other supplies that are necessary to enable us achieve right. the prevention and uh, treatment goals. So we think that this disconnect has been perhaps there, but it was because of the nature of the epidemic and how we responded. But thus far it has served as well, but now we think more of eliminating the parallel systems and integrating the approach towards uh, HIV in a more kind of routine way as opposed to a special way. All right, uh, Mr. Lawrence, you have the final word on this. What will it take for Africa to get to zero? Africa will get to zero and you lead the world to zero. The solution for AIDS rests in Africa. The response in Africa you determine the, the future of this epidemic and the future of all of us globally. Uh, but, you, uh, but we need to mind uh, a few issues if you are serious about going to zero. First of all, we need to change the way that we are doing business. As we spoke before, we need to close the gaps. These populations that are staying behind, like young women, men that have sex with men, sex workers, intravenous drug users, they need to be included in the response. In many cases, they need to lead us to the response to AIDS. There is no end of AIDS with anybody left behind. Uh, another aspect is the time. There is a window. We have five years from now to turn the tide. We did some modeling exercise exploring the future scenarios that we have ahead of us, including get to zero. Right. To get to zero, the next five years are crucial. All right, uh, Mr. Louis Lawrence, we'll leave it there for the moment. Deputy Executive Director, UNAIDS, thank you for joining us uh, from Geneva in studio. Dr. Kizito Lubano, researcher with the Kenya Medical Research Institute, joining me here in Nairobi. And also joining me in Nairobi, Geoffrey Ocheng, a youth HIV and a TB advocate joining us as well in studio. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us on the program. I'm Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Goodbye.